Um, thank you, uh, Vincent, for the nice introduction. Um, and hel hello, everyone. And uh, I hope um, you can hear me very well. Um, yeah, today, as Vincent introduced, uh, I'm from uh, KAUST, uh, uh, KAUST Photovoltaics Laboratory. And here at KAUST, actually, we are working on uh, perovskite silicon tandem solar cells with multiple aspects. Uh, but today, I will keep the topic a little bit narrow, and I will discuss how we do efficient and champion perovskite silicon tandem solar cells uh, using a solution processing technique. And uh, before starting, maybe it's better to uh, thank all the contributors in advance. And today, I will cover the, uh, the works of my some colleagues, including myself, um, and Furkan, Jiang, Michele, Shingiz, and uh, you know, our professor is uh, Stefan de Wolf, is uh, our PI. Um, and here we are a little bit crowded team, almost um, 30 people in our team at the moment, and majorly we are focusing on the efficient perovskite silicon tandem solar cells and the perovskite solar cells. Um, yeah, actually, the first question, so how, uh, why actually we work on this topic, and I'm, I'm confident that, and most of you are aware of uh, the, the potential of the perovskite silicon tandem solar cells, uh, but maybe briefly to introduce, and as you know that today's um, uh, the, the, the state of the art and mainstream PV technology is the silicon solar cells. And the, for silicon solar cells, we have several alternatives. And the, so far, the most efficient silicon solar cell uh, configuration is um, the silicon heterojunctions. And the, these devices are, at the moment, can be fabricated uh, with efficiencies around 26.7%. Uh, this is an IBC configuration, which means that there is a on the back contact. Uh, and the, the double contacted, I mean, double side contacted devices can be fabricated uh, recently around 26.2%. But actually, um, these devices are really approaching their practical limits. Um, and the, the nowadays, uh, increasing their efficiency further is impractical, almost impractical, let's say. Um, so, so why we want to increase the efficiency? Actually, I mean, the answer is very simple. I don't want to answer the details too much, but. Uh, basically, we want to lower the uh, levelized cost of electricity uh, as much as possible. And since we are not able to reduce the, the side costs, including, you know, encapsulation, installation costs, and uh, the inverter cost, so the best way to in uh, decrease the LCOE at the moment um, is increasing the efficiency of the solar cells. Um, and as we are limited uh, with, the, uh, with this concept, so... I mean, the, the tandem uh, device configuration could be quite interesting. And before giving what is tandem, uh, maybe it's better to show this graph. As you see here, this, I mean, this is the progress of the silicon heterojunction solar cells. And this is the, uh, the progress of the perovskite silicon tandem solar cells. And uh, maybe um, we can say that this perovskite silicon um, can be the, the continuation of the, uh, the single junction silicon heterojunction solar cells. And efficiency potential is well beyond at the single junction. I will touch it here. And here you see uh, that the solar spectrum uh, between five, I mean, 300 and 2,500 nanometers. And if you use only silicon solar cells, we are able to cover the, this portion of the spectrum. Uh, but if you use a multi junction devices, which means that if we add another subcell on top of the, the silicon solar cells, uh, we can cover uh, the spectrum more, more effectively by minimizing the thermalization losses. Um, and in this case, our efficiency potential is rising around uh, above 40 percent, which was around 32, 33 percent for the uh, the single junction crystalline silicon solar cells. Um, and uh, actually, this brings a, uh, this opens a huge potential um, to further decrease the LC value of the, the, the PV panels. And for sure, the higher efficiencies are possible if you would like to cover uh, the spectrum more effectively. You can add the third junction, fourth junction, but these are uh, maybe the next generation devices. But the main point here is that if you want to make a, a, these tandem solar cells um, uh, industrially uh, feasible, uh, I mean, you have to find the cost-effective uh, subcell uh, which, can, which you can couple with the crystalline silicon bottom cell. So, so far, although we had some options, actually none of them were, uh, although they, we had some efficient options, actually we didn't have uh, cost-effective options until we have the perovskites. And perovskites are really uh, amazing materials. Uh, and in a very short time, they, they progressed uh, a lot. And the efficiencies of the single junction device are already exceeding 25% at laboratory scale. 
And we have a lot of uh, flexibilities for the processing and bandcap tunability. Um, and it's a great material for the tandem solar cells. So um, the, the tandem research actually started in around 2013. Uh, uh, after a couple of years, the first single junction perovskite solar cells were introduced. And the, initially, the, uh, the architecture was double side planar bottom cells. And actually, the field uh, very quickly abandoned this configuration. Um, because of the, actually the poor optical response of the devices and the field moved uh, the rear side texture to front side planar devices. The main motivation behind this uh, using all garnered knowledge uh, for the single junction devices so we could easily transfer them to the tandem devices. But actually this system was optical and not, per not perfect. Uh, and recently we introduced a double side texture tandem devices. Actually, this is not new. Uh, previously, uh, the EPFL team has also uh, introduced a conformal coating but actually our major motivation was utilizing the solution processing, uh, which is the, uh, I, I can tell the mainstream uh, processing technique in the whole perovskite community. And I mean, acquiring this experience uh, and applying this to the perovskite uh, silicon tandem solar cells and achieving uh, the champion devices. So this was our uh, major motivation. So, but actually uh, we have uh, too much flexibility for these devices and we can flip the polarity as well. Uh, today, I will, I will try to cover both PIN and IP configuration devices. Uh, and before that, I just wanted to show uh, how the device are, uh, they look like. Um, so the next section, um, so uh, as I explained, I mean, uh, the initial configuration of these devices uh, were in front side planar devices. Um, but actually, uh, we know that optically, uh, uh, the double side texture devices are quite um, uh, useful um, and we can really minimize the current losses, reflection losses, and increase the, the current density of the devices. Uh, and also uh, in industry, all silicon heterojunction devices are fabricated uh, with a double side texturing because if you want to fabricate front side planar devices, you have to put additional processing step. Um, uh, and also uh, we can easily integrate our perovskite uh, subcell processing to the industrial lines. Um, so this was the major motivation. We work on the double side texture tandem device, but uh, sorry, double side texture uh, bottom cells. And first, for sure, we took uh, one commercial uh, silicon heterojunction solar cell, and we attempted to deposit uh, our uh, best uh, one-step perovskite processing on top of it. And this is the thing we see. And for sure, um, if you look at the cross section of these devices, and these are the, the random pyramids. And if you deposit the perovskites with the regular uh, the processing, you see that the pyramids are coming out. And if you finish your contacts and electron transport layer and also the transparent electrodes, um, the, th the thing we see is also, I mean, it basically is the shunted devices. So uh, to overcome this problem, uh, we follow three major strategy. And the first one, uh, we, we tune the pyramid size by, uh, while keeping the, the, uh, the reflection still minimized. And we adjusted the recombination junction and we adjusted our per uh, perovskite processing to enable a full coverage on this uh, micron size textual surfaces. So the first thing, adjusting the, uh, the, the, the texturing size. And the, here you see, uh, if you start using a, a commercial grade uh, silicon heterojunction solar cells, they have a uh, the, the, the texturing size, uh, at least above four microns, and it's difficult to fabricate a four or five micron stick uh, perovskite. Uh, so that's why our motivation was uh, tuning the, the wet processing, and we decreased the, uh, I mean, we tuned the KOH concentration, and we tuned the temperature of the, the bed. So finally, uh, we, we had a chance to tune the, uh, the pyramid size, and here you see the uh, average weight of the reflectance, and we found that actually, in this case, uh, if we uh, fabricate uh, the, the pyramids around two micrometer in average, uh, we still have a good uh, minimized reflectance on the wafers. Um, and we, we also have still very well distributed uh, pyramids on the surface of the wafers. So at this point, uh, we did our choice and we moved on uh, the next step. And we, we uh, for sure, for to fabricate efficient tandem devices, we had to deposit effective recombination junction. And this is the core part of the tandem devices, which is connecting to two subcell. 
um, and uh, from the silicon heterojunction bottom cells, uh, the ITO is uh, by default is coming. So our motivation was depositing another HDL on top of it. And here our, our choice was uh, sputtered uh, nickel oxide because a sputtering process is really enables conformal uh, coating on this kind of complex surfaces. And we had a thickness control. Um, uh, actually, another choice is also, I will discuss in the next slides. Uh, we also, later on, we start use also self assembly monolayers. Um, and after creating uh, effective recombination junctions, the third step is uh, fabricating uh, thick perovskites on top of the, this uh, microsite pyramidal texturing. So for this, uh, between the perovskite processing and the, the, the critical thing we did here is increasing the concentration further and the overall we issued end-to-end um, -end coverage uh, on top of the, uh, the micron-sized pyramids. So uh, the next question actually, uh, after we start this work, so is the micronic perovskite a problem? Because achieving a highly crystalline films was difficult um, and uh, we were really curious about uh, the, the tilt factor of the devices um, and before doing this, actually, we first uh, tried to understand how the electric field is distributed. We did some uh, modeling and also we performed some uh, KPFM cross-section uh, KPFM measurements. And we found that actually the electric field distribution is really different than the planar devices. And the, the conclusion is, uh, was here, uh, if you use a textured, uh, if you deposit perovskites on textured surfaces, we really enhance the drift region. Um, and this really helps for the efficient charge extraction. Um, and this was actually the additional uh, benefits of the uh, processing of the perovskites on, um, on the top of the textured interfaces. Uh, so after that, actually, we fabricated our uh, overall tandem devices by finishing the contacts. Uh, so this is the appearance of the, uh, the one centimeter square devices we do here. Um, um, and we use a Perovskite band gave around 1.60 ATV. This was a one-step process perovskite. And the recombination junction was uh, nickel oxide in indium oxide. Indium oxide is a trivial here. It can be also ITO, ISO, it doesn't matter. Um, and the, actually we start to see the real benefits when we measure EQ. And as you see here, uh, we really minimize the reflections here. We achieve the quite uh, planar um, response here uh, by minimizing the reflectance. And also since we have a quite thick perovskite, uh, we had a good response on the perovskite top cell and we minimized the, the response of the, uh, the, the silicon device. And in this case, we had a chance to uh, decrease the band cap further. And the, for sure, this helped us to enhance the voltage. And overall, uh, to push the, actually uh, the voltage higher, we also did a uh, self-assembled surface passivation uh, with, uh, with an atoll. And overall, actually, we achieved uh, uh, the efficiencies above 25.7%. And the field factors were really um, the, quite satisfying here. And this study took place in science and we did a collaboration with the uh, University of Toronto. Um, at that time, this was the, one of the champion devices. So for sure, we didn't stop here. We continued uh, doing um, opt further optimizing these devices. First, uh, we had to focus on the, uh, the perovskite uh, because we know that the perovskite accommodates several defects. Uh, and interface also, I mean, perovskite contact interface also accom accommodate several defects. Um, so our major motivation was actually really passivating these defects and pushing the, the VOC uh, of these devices as high as possible. Um, and we know that uh, the nickel oxide perovskite uh, interfaces has some uh, undesired redox reactions, and this really causes a uh, the, uh, the really voltage losses on the devices and in terms of also stability, um, uh, this is an uh, undesired situation. Uh, so we decided to passivate the surface of the nickel oxide using a, a molecule. Here I cho our choice was dye passivation. Um, and actually we chose this dye specifically because it had and positively and negatively charged uh, groups uh, and it, it really helped us uh, to passivate the, the, the nickel oxide surface using this uh, cyanate and the carboxylic groups. And at the same time, we also had a chance to coordinate the, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the defects or actually the vacancies uh, at the perovskite side. Um, and overall, we had a good uh, passivation with this uh, 
with this own di dime molecule. Um, so um, this really help us to enhance the voltage of the devices. You see here uh, the cost of thermal level splitting imaging uh, um, in a micron scale. And our voltage uh, is really enhanced around 1.78 at that time. And it is really uh, improved the, the thermal stability of the devices. So our efficiency now, uh, we push it around 26.2, but for sure, um, still uh, we are not at the perfect level. And actually our next step was um, uh, moving uh, much better uh, hull transport layers. And uh, these this, uh, self-assembly monolayer HDLs have been introduced recently by the HZB and Kaunas uh, University of Technology teams. Um, the, in our case, we found also they are working quite effectively on our textured interfaces um, and they provide really high voltage. Uh, and also we, we could deposit them conformally on these uh, textured interfaces um, without any residual on the valleys and also on the top, uh, top of the tips. Um, overall, uh, we utilize them on our next uh, tandem uh, device project, but uh, in the same project, we used also uh, the perovskite passivation passivator. And in this case, our choice was a panformin hydrochloride. Again, we tried to choose the best possible molecule for our devices. Uh, and the idea was uh, doing a concurrent uh, cationic and anionic, uh, an anionic uh, uh, perovskite defect passivation. For this, we choose again molecule which has a positively and negatively um, a charge groups. Um, and the, uh, the idea was, um, as I said, um, passivating the defects on the perovskite surface as much as possible. Uh, here we choose this molecule, actually, the, another motivation to choose this molecule was, um, and it's actually soluble, it's with the perovskite benign solvents, uh, this, this help us uh, to use, uh, to mix it inside the perovskite precursor and also passive with the grain boundaries. Um, and when we do this, uh, I mean, if we do grain boundary passivation and surface passivation together, we had a chance to decrease the, uh, the voltage losses around 180 millivolt. Um, and as you see here, we also had a quite a good um, uh, perovskite homogeneity um, uh, after uh, the, the surface passivation via performing hydrochloride. Uh, and also our actual efficiency here uh, boosted around uh, the 27.4%. Per and this study was done by my colleague at Kaos uh, Fukan. Um, so the voltage now is around 1.84 volts. Um, and actually we achieved a quite good improvement, but still uh, our devices are not in a perfect condition. Um, and the, 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 our motivation was actually pushing the feed factor a little bit higher. And for this, we were looking for uh, smaller uh, molecules. And another uh, motivation uh, also uh, finding a new molecule was uh, when we do some stability tests, we found that uh, actually especially for at elevated temperatures, the ion migration really starts to be um, dominated, uh, dominating a degradation mechanism. So for the next step, our choice was carbazole. And this is a very simple and small molecule as we use also carbazole in the whole transport layer. Um, and we choose this molecule uh, because I mean, it, it contains nitrogen containing heterocyclic uh, molecule. And it's also, um, uh, it, it, I mean, it doesn't fit inside the perovskite uh, lattice, so we can easily uh, mix inside the perovskite precursor, and it's going to be automatically um, segregated at the grain boundaries. I mean, this is our actual hypothesis. Uh, it's really difficult to provide uh, evidence for this. But it, uh, once we do a temperature-dependent admittance measurements, we found that really um, we are able to minimize the, the defects at the grain boundaries. Um, because, as I said, um, we found that especially for uh, at elevated temperatures, if you do uh, the, the stability test, we found that this, uh, the grain boundaries are working like ion channels and the degradation starts from here. And we targeted this, this region um, and we found that uh, this, this passivation molecule really helps to decrease the, uh, the number of defects at the grain boundary specifically. Um, so. Uh, in our lab, uh, so we achieved with these devices efficiencies around 28.9 uh, and stabilized 28.6 percent, and uh, we certified this independently at Japan uh, with 28.2 percent efficiency. And this study came out in June uh, a few months ago, 
And this study was performed by my colleague Jiang here. Um, so, um, and for sure, um, spin coating is not fully scalable device, but um, we also had attempt to fabricate uh, devices at the medium uh, scale. Uh, and we fabricated device around the four centimeter square and we found actually this process really can be applied at medium scale uh, devices. Uh, and we achieved efficiencies around the 27% if we fabricate uh, around 3.8 centimeters square. And we had also a huge, uh, I mean, great homogeneity over the vapor, as you see here, uh, from if you measure EQ from different spots, we didn't see uh, any change. So actually, uh, the point how this enhanced the, the stability um, of the, uh, the devices. So uh, we try to understand the mechanism better and we performed some PL measurements. Uh, we exposed this, actually first we encapsulated the samples uh, between two glass. Um, and after that, we exposed the samples with the, uh, the PL, uh, I mean, with a green uh, laser, uh, but this is not one sun. Uh, we, we increased the intensity of 10 sun to see the accelerated degradation. And we found that um, uh, if we, I mean, if we do this on control samples uh, by time, uh, we start to see uh, a peak broadening is happening. And this is actually the signature of that iodide rich uh, trap states are happening uh, on the, the sample. Uh, but if you use a carbazole, um, carbaz after carbazole treatment, uh, we really suppress this, um, this, this uh, peak formation uh, with the similar conditions. And also my colleague uh, Jiang tested this in the ambient conditions. And he found that really uh, the carbazole treated samples are uh, even stable. Uh, in the ambient conditions. Um, so uh, overall, um, after that, actually, we put the samples to the, uh, to the outdoor. This brings me to uh, the part of my talk about the outdoor test. Um, actually, here at Kaos, we use outdoor tests uh, quite frequently um, because we believe that um, uh, when we put the device at outside, uh, really, we start to see the, uh, the real character of the devices because um, in the test field, uh, in the real operating conditions, uh, the multiple external st stressors work together to degrade the devices. So, uh, but if you do the experiments in the lab, we, we just disentangle the problem into the small pieces and we start to see the, the single parameter. Uh, you see a photograph from our uh, test uh, solar park test facilities at KAUST. And this is uh, located in Jeddah. We are, our university is also located in Jeddah. Uh, this is a really hot and sunny climate. Uh, I think Vincent uh, knows very well. <laughs> um, so we have a test platform here, and this is a bit old-fashioned photo, but actually now we have more updated uh, version of this test uh, field, and we are able to test multiple devices at the same time. And we also have a pyranometer. We, we can record the, the sun intensity, wind speed, and everything. So we really do um, a proper outdoor stability test here. Um, actually, I don't want to enter the, uh, too much details about uh, the outdoor um, uh, test details, but I want to discuss uh, very quickly our uh, observations. This study came out in Nature Energy in 2020. Um, the first observation when we put the samples at outside, actually we found that the temperature of the cells are really high. Uh, it, the, the cells can reach around 60 centigrade degree uh, with encapsulated devices. And using this empirical model, we use also uh, this, this value is actually we created an empirical model and we predicted the whole year uh, the module temperature and we found that at, actually during the summertime um, uh, even at these given conditions we are able to reach around 60 centigrade degree for the device temperature this has some important consequences on the device design um, and the very first thing we observed uh, the band gap uh, for ideal band gap for these uh, perovskite silicon tandem solar cells changed because of uh, the perovskite and the, the silicon subcells, uh, the semiconductors uh, responding in a different uh, way to do the temperature change, uh, while the perovskite solar cell band gap is widened and the, 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 the silicon band gap is narrowing. And this actually changed the ideal uh, perovskite uh, band gap condition at uh, elevated temperatures. And uh, actually, if you consider the most idealized device system, uh, this value. Uh, decreases to 1.68, uh, which was around 1.74 in the past. And this is a good news because uh, we can fabricate 
uh, more efficient tandem devices in the future um, if we really uh, want to operate this device in hot and sunny climates. Um, and uh, I'll continue uh, the work of uh, Jiang here. As I said, I mean, we, we put this device outdoor for more than 40 days, and we found that uh, the carbazole treated devices are really uh, showing a good uh, stability. At least the VOC of the device are pretty stable. And this is a PL image of these devices using a hyperspectral imager, uh, hyperspectral PL imager. And the bottom line is showing uh, the, the carbazole treated one. This one is showing the, the control sample. And we found that um, uh, the control sample is forming uh, iodine-rich regions. These are providing brighter emission, as you see here. Um, and uh, we really suppress this, this phase segregation if you use a carbazole additive. And also, uh, it really prevents the ion migration at the grain boundaries. Actually, this is our understanding. And after 40 days, we found that devices can retain their 93% of their initial efficiency, while this is around 77% for the, the control samples. Uh, another thing we observed uh, in the field, uh, also um, uh, for the degradation of the devices, uh, was the contacts and specifically the C60. And this is a bit interesting uh, because um, we found that actually, if uh, before putting the devices in the field, this is the AFM image uh, top topography of the perovskite C60. Uh, as you see here, the C60 is quite um, uh, normal, but actually after uh, almost a six month uh, uh, exposure to the uh, in the field, we found that it starts to form a kind of spherical agglomerate. So we don't know what, what are they at the moment. Uh, still, we are trying to figure out uh, why this is happening. Uh, we also did the collaboration with EPFL, PV Lab, uh, for this work. And another thing we observed, actually, uh, when we keep devices long time in the field, um, the, the contacts are forming silver iodide. Uh, actually, this is happening. We understood this later. We, we found that if we don't have a full device area, I mean, uh, since our devices are um, uh, smaller than the substrate area, uh, the, the, the iodine is released from the edge of the devices and they are reaccumulating on top of the contacts and it's forming a silver iodide and it's really affect the contact uh, stability and the performance of the devices decreasing is decreasing, specifically the field factor is decreasing. Um, so another thing recently we observed actually uh, in the field because of these temperature cycles, uh, the delamination occurs, and this is a quite fresh paper, came out recently in ACS Energy Letters, again, uh, from my colleague, Michele De Bastiani. Um, and we explored that, actually, we have a quite big adhesion between the, uh, the C60 and tin oxide. Uh, basically, there is no uh, the chemical bonding uh, between uh, these, these two layers. And this is the weakest point of the devices. Uh, and if you, if you do a peel-off test, you will see that, actually, the devices are peeled from this interface easily. And the, we found that actually this is also another problem uh, in the field uh, if you want to keep your devices long time. Um, so, um, so far I explained our monofacial tandem device progress, um, but actually recently uh, we start to explore also bifacial tandem solar cells. Uh, this is again the, another advantage of the solution process perovskites uh, because uh, we have a huge uh, band gap tunability for the perovskite top cell. Um, so we, we just wanted to extend our skills to the biofacial devices. And this is, you know, uh, it's a, a mainstream, uh, I mean, it starts to be the mainstream uh, the PV technology in the market recently. And the, the projections are showing that the market share of the, the biofacial uh, solar cells will reach around 70% in 2020, sorry, 2030. Um, so uh, I, we believe that actually the bifacial, I mean, the, the silicon perovskite tandem solar cells also will really uh, uh, evolve in this direction. Um, the main motivation using bifacial solar cells very briefly is increasing for sure uh, the power output. So how we do this? Uh, if we use a monofacial devices, uh, we use a direct light, uh, but in bifacial mode, we also get benefits from the, the reflected light, we call this albedo. Um, uh, the only thing we do on the devices, you know, we have a opaque, uh, full area metal contact, which is non-transparent. We remove this and we put a finger at the rear side. We also, we allow the device illuminated also from the back, uh, which is reflected from the ground. Uh, in this case, uh, the bottom cell provides more current density. Then we have to 
uh, satisfy this current density with the top cell. And for this, uh, the better, best option is decreasing the, the band cap, and which is quite easy with the spin coating process, uh, the one-step spin coating process. We have quite good recipes in the literature. Um, and after that, uh, we can get overall higher current density from the devices. But I will discuss in the next slides. Actually, this brings us another advantage because uh, we really get rid of from the, the phase segregation problem because we are using a low band cap perovskites. Um, I don't want to again go in detail. This is a bit, uh, this can be topic of another talk, uh, but very briefly, um, and you, you, you see here the different albedos, which means that we change the illumination of the bottom cell with different intensities. This is the 20% of the, for instance, 20% of one sun. Um, so we find, we find that actually, uh, uh, if we do 20% albedo, the current density of the device is already is saturating and is reaching around 21 milliamps. And after increasing uh, the albedo further, uh, we don't see too much changes. Uh, the albedo change based on the, the ground conditions. I mean, uh, I mean, as a specific example for sand, it's very typical in Saudi Arabia, is around 30%. Uh, this is already sufficient to get actually the champion devices. Um, now we don't uh, talk about efficiency, we talk about power generation density because we have uh, additional illumination at the rear side. Um, and uh, we found that actually, uh, if we use a bifacial tandem solar cells, our power output almost uh, always higher than the monofacial devices. Um, so, as I said, um, this uh, this makes uh, uh, this brings another advantage to these devices. We can make them really uh, long term stable. Uh, you see a device after we keep them six months in the field. There are a lot of dust on it. This is quite natural in Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is a closer view to the, the device pixels. And after we get the devices, we broke encapsulation and we check the devices. Um, and this is this work again done by my colleague by uh, Michele De Bastiani. Uh, we saw that actually uh, we don't see too much um, uh, the, the PL emission variation, even if we are approaching very close to the metal contacts, we don't see too much variation. This, this is good news because this shows that if we keep devices six months in hot and sunny climate, we don't have um, phase segregation or degradation on the devices. And this actually, uh, the, the, the variation of the VOC confirms uh, this behavior. We really get a quite stable uh, open circuit voltage from the devices. And I don't show here the power conversion efficiency uh, because the field factor of the devices are decreasing. And uh, there is a kind of uh, two different mechanism uh, over there. Uh, I don't want to discuss this here. As I said, it's a bit long discussion. Uh, but uh, I explained why the field factor is decreasing in the previous slides, and most, uh, most of this is happening due to contacts, not from the perovskite side. Um, okay, I mean, after mentioning also uh, the outdoor test and the bifacial devices, this is the, the very last part of my talk. Um, the NIP tandems, um, yeah, actually, as I said in the beginning of my talk, uh, we have huge flexibility to fabricate uh, perovskite silicon tandem solar cells. Uh, we can change the polarization of the devices by flipping the, the bottom cell easily. Uh, so we did this, but there's a point here I want to discuss very quickly. Um, and as you know, uh, uh, the initial, sorry, uh, the initial perovskite silicon tandem solar cells were in NIP configuration in around 2014. Um, but um, suddenly uh, the fields uh, field moved on uh, the, the PION configuration tandem devices. Actually, I think this started with the Nature Energy paper of the McGehee team. Uh, and after that, all record devices came out with the PION devices. Um, so, so our major question, so what happened? And these devices, um, uh, the NIP device progress uh, almost stopped. Um, so uh, after we invest, start investigating these devices, we, hunt, we found actually three major problems. Uh, one of them is the electron transport layer, um, and if you want to use a, a, a fish, if you want to fabricate efficient NIP tandem solar cells, you have to find efficient electron transport layer. So far, uh, the best electron transport layer was a mesoporous titanium dioxide, and this was processed really at high temperature. Uh, the alternative of this was uh, processing the, uh, the nanoparticle tin oxide. This is really quite promising recently. Uh, but once we fabricate uh, the tin oxide by spin coating, we found that actually we are not able to get a formal coating on the, uh, the wafers, and this really hinders the charge transport. And our choice uh, here was uh, fabricating a niobium oxide, uh, 
Aluminum oxide is a kind of dielectric material, but if you fabricate it with the sputtering technique, you are getting a conformal layers. And also uh, interesting to niobium, I mean, this is specific to niobium oxide. Um, uh, uh, it's uh, within the band cap actually, there are, almost there is no defects. And it, it, it's quite interesting. Um, and even if fabricated 50 nanometers of niobium oxide, our device performance were pretty good. And after fabricating some single junction devices, we fabricated tandem devices and we found it's working quite effectively on tandem devices as well. Um, also, the, the second thing was uh, uh, hindering the progress of the NIP tandem devices were uh, spirometer. Uh, this is maybe uh, by far the best whole transport layer reported for the NIP devices and still the state of the art, uh, but it caused too much parasitic absorption losses on the devices. And our choice here was uh, thinning down uh, the spiral, but not by solution processing because it's difficult to achieve a conformal coating. So we use the evaporation method and we achieved ultra thin um, uh, spiral TTB uh, and we dope it uh, with a molecular dopant. And after that, we stack it with the uh, atomic layer deposited to one of the oxide layers and we achieved a quite good contact stack on the devices. And the third thing, uh, for sure, and this is the uh, maybe the persistent problem uh, of the uh, the NIP devices, and there are many of many actually solutions in the literature have been reported. And here our approach was using a, a C60 self-assembly monolayer between the niobium oxide and perovskite, and combining all these things, uh, we really decreased the hysteresis. I mean, using a, uh, actually we use also the surface passivation on top of the perovskite using a 2D, 3D uh, the perovskites. Um, and combining all these uh, different uh, passivation approach, we minimize the hysteresis and uh, it, it approached almost zero. So we applied this uh, progress onto the, uh, the tandem devices and we achieved efficiencies around the 27%. And here the important thing is that these devices really deliver with high kind of density, which was uh, pretty low around uh, below 17 milliamps in the past. And we progressed a lot and we fabricated uh, the tandem devices are around 19.5 milliamps per centimeter square. To be honest, uh, these devices can be fabricated with the, with the higher kind of densities. Um, if we can replace the spiral TTB with a more transparent contacts, this is possible because in PIN configuration, replacing the, the front contact is really difficult. I mean, there is almost there is no alternative to C60 at the moment. Um, but in, in an IP device tandem case, actually, we have several opportunities and there are a lot of research opportunities here. Um, and as I said, I mean, uh, efficiencies beyond 30% is still possible with the uh, NIP tandem solar cells. Very last thing for this NIP part. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, for the single junction devices, maybe you can see several stability results and people report uh, thousands of hours of stability. But with this configuration, um, since we use a molecular dopped contact, um, we, we had to find a solution uh, to prevent the redox reactions between the vanadium oxide and uh, the spiral TTB. So we put ultra thin TPBI layer, layer and the, the lone pairs actually on this uh, molecule, uh, we have abundant lone pairs and they, they have coordinated the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the metal atoms at the, the uh, vanadium side, vanadium oxide side, and this extended the stability of the device. This study was covered uh, in ES uh, in August 2021, um, and uh, it, I mean, attracted a lot of uh, attention in the field. So uh, uh, this brings my to the end of my talk. Maybe some closing remarks. Um, so at Kaust, uh, the we fabricate uh, perovskite silicon tandem solar cells with the different uh, alternative aspects. I mean. The spin coated perovskite is not the only option we work here. We also work on the slow die coated tandems. We work, we work also evaporation, hybrid conversion, uh, combination of evaporation and solution processing. Um, uh, and we, we work also on the scalability of these devices. We had some attempts to fabricate spin coated perovskites of a large area, and uh, uh, we demonstrated some devices around 50 centimeters square. Um, uh, I mean, it, maybe it's difficult to reach a 16 size uh, for with the spin coating, but still, this is a very nice platform, and it actually we learned a lot of things with, uh, by using a spin coating technique. Um, and uh, all these learnings are universal and independent from the perovskite processing, um, and it can be applied also to other device configurations easily. Um, and some uh, take-home messages, and in this talk, 
uh, the one of the main messages um, and the textured interfaces are really uh, promising and, the, and definitely we have to do some passivation on the devices um, uh, to uh, actually to, to scale up these devices we need more dedicated efforts for the scaling up and outdoor stability is um, is good indicator for the device stability uh, bipatial tandem solar cells uh, carry high potential uh, to be more efficient and stable uh, in perovskite silicon tandem solar cells case and NIP devices can provide opportunities beyond 30% uh, efficiency. And thank you for your attention.